OK, and the next item of business is a statement by Patrick Harvey on Cost of Living Tenant Protection Scotland Act. The Minister will take questions at the end of his statement, and therefore there should be no interventions or interruptions. And I call on Patrick Harvey, Minister, for around 10 minutes, please. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. I'm pleased to be able to make a statement today to Parliament to accompany publication of the first of the Scottish Government's three monthly reports on the Cost of Living Tenant Protection Scotland Act covering the period 28th of October to 31st December 2022. Parliament, of course, will recall that we took emergency legislative action in October last year to provide critical time-limited protection for people who rent their homes. Uh, people renting have, uh, on average, lower household incomes, higher levels of poverty, and are more vulnerable to economic shocks. 63% of social rented households and 40% of private rented households don't have enough savings to cover even a month of income at the poverty line. And that's compared to 24% of households buying with a mortgage and 9% of households who own outright. With this context in mind, the Act had three key aims. To protect tenants by stabilising their uh, housing costs through the, the rent freeze, to reduce the impact of evictions and homelessness through a moratorium on evictions, and to avoid tenants being evicted from the rented sector by a landlord wanting to raise rents between tenancies during the temporary measures and reduce unlawful evictions. The provisions are in place until 31st of March, and Scottish ministers can, with the approval of Parliament, extend for two further six-month periods, should circumstances and evidence show this to be necessary. Presiding officer, all of us continue to hear the evidence from our constituents across the country on the unprecedented challenges being faced by people across Scotland due to the ongoing cost of living crisis. This unprecedented economic position has not yet changed fundamentally, and I know that many households on low and modest incomes continue to struggle. People are facing increased costs across the board, and the biggest impact is felt by those on the lowest incomes. The Office for National Statistics estimated that inflation for low-income households was 11.9% in October 2022, leaving very many people struggling to cope. The current economic situation uh, is a key part of our ongoing review of the Emergency Cost of Living Act. Similar to the approach that we took to the coronavirus emergency legislation, we committed to reviewing and reporting on the ongoing necessity and proportionality of the provisions within the Act. And Parliament will recall, of course, that during the passage uh, of the, the bill uh, in Parliament, uh, in recognition of the distinctive ways in which the rent cap provisions impacted on social rented sector landlords in particular, the Government brought forward a Stage 3 amendment which committed to setting out our intention for the rent cap provisions within the social sector beyond the 31st of March, doing so within this first report and by no later than the 14th of January. So that's where I want to start today. I've been clear from the outset that I wanted to work with the social rented sector to seek an agreed way forward as an alternative to continuation of the rent cap beyond March 2023. Parliament will be aware that we have been working closely with a range of social rented sector organisations, including COSLA, the Scottish Federation of Housing Associations and Glasgow and West of Scotland Forum of Housing Associations through a task and finish group. Statements of intent were published late last year by COSLA, confirming local authorities' commitment to keeping rent increases in April this year to an average of no more than £5 a week and by the Scottish Federation of Housing Associations, who reported that their members are consulting with tenants on a set of increases in April that will average 6.1%. While I anticipate that many rents will be increased at a level well below these figures, the agreement to set out average figures rather than a fixed cap allows for flexibility for social landlords to respond to the consultations with their tenants, which are part of their statutory responsibilities as landlords. There may be some social sector landlords who will, for specific reasons, have to go beyond this level. For example, to allow for planned improvements or maintenance to proceed as agreed through tenant engagement. This will allow for the statutory tenant consultations currently taking place to be taken properly into account for housing associations' business plans uh, and for local authorities' housing revenue account plans. Uh, 
and no social landlord is consulting on a rent increase at or above CPI inflation, which was 11.1% at the time of the data being collected. In light of the voluntary agreements that have been reached across the social sector, I can confirm that we will now bring forward legislation to expire the social rented sector cap provisions from March 2023. Having set out the position on social sector rents, I want to turn now to the position as it affects the other parts of the Emergency Act and other parts of the rented sector. The report that we published today uh, sets out that Scottish ministers have undertaken a review of the provisions of Part 1 of the Act in order to consider whether those provisions remain necessary and proportionate in connection with the cost of living. This first report both considers the status of measures through to 31st of December, the initial period of the legislation, and alludes to what factors might be taken into account post 31st March to determine the ongoing necessity of these measures, which will be subject to separate parliamentary processes later this month. At the end of this first reporting period, it is clear that the unprecedented economic challenges are continuing to impact acutely on those who rent their home. And therefore, having considered the outcome of this review, Scottish ministers are satisfied that the status of the Part 1 provisions in the Act is appropriate at the end of this reporting period. This will be kept under uh, review going forward. On the next issue, Presiding Officer, while the Scottish Government is committed uh, to expiring or suspending specific provisions as they are no longer necessary, emerging evidence on the cost crisis makes it likely at present uh, that some of the provisions of the Act will be required after the current expiry date of the 31st of March. For example, in order to continue to reduce the impacts of eviction and homelessness on tenants in both the social and private rented sectors, it would appear crucial that the current moratorium on evictions continues, with, of course, the safeguards that were put in place last October. In addition, the Chamber will be aware of the distinct differences between how the social and private rented sectors operate. Clearly, there are still economic challenges facing private renters, and uh, there is not the opportunity to agree a collective voluntary approach in the private rented uh, sector, given the very different nature uh, of the sectors. So I would anticipate that it will remain necessary and proportionate to extend the rent cap provisions beyond the 31st of March in the private rented sector, while recognising that the Act gives power to vary what the cap actually is. Our consideration of the rent cap in relation to student accommodation is also being considered, particularly in light of the evidence showing that it is having a very limited impact due again to the different way in which such tenancies are managed. And I hope to be able to set out our intentions on this very soon. Presiding officer, these are uh, all matters that we will continue to weigh up and bring back to Parliament soon with specific proposals based on the most up-to-date evidence available. And the decision on whether to extend is, of course, for the whole Parliament to make. And we look forward to hearing the outcome uh, of the future consideration of these matters. Presiding officer, as required by Section 9 of the Act, Scottish ministers have conducted a review of the provisions of, in Part 1 of the Cost of Living Tenant Protection Scotland Act and have prepared this report. We are satisfied that the status of the provisions set out in Part 1 of the Act uh, as at 31st December remain appropriate. We have also undertaken a review of the associated SSIs. Scottish ministers are also satisfied that the status of those SSIs at the end of the reporting period is appropriate. The provisions we report on today are one part of Scotland's ongoing response to the cost of living crisis. This government will continue uh, to do our duty to report and to be held accountable to Parliament for the use of these powers. And we welcome the opportunity of engagement with uh, Parliament and MSPs uh, as this uh, first report is considered. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you, Mr Harvey. The Minister will now take questions on the issues raised in his statement. I intend to allow around 20 minutes, after which we will need to move on to the next item of business. So, um, I would be grateful if members wishing to ask a question would press the request to speak buttons now or as soon as possible. And I call Miles Briggs. Thank you, uh, Deputy President Officer. Um, 
And I think from that statement, it is clear that the SNP Green Labour emergency rent legislation is rapidly becoming an unmitigated disaster. Scottish Conservatives warned MSPs about the impact on the destabilisation of both the social and private housing sectors, but ministers pressed ahead anyway. Social rented sector, I very much welcome now, has been removed from this, but the damage has already been done. And what does this mean for people in the social rented sector? Well, they're likely now, instead of seeing an average rent increase of 6.1%, that could be an increase of up to 11.1%. So this government is driving rents up at the same time it says it wants to do something. And today, what has been given by the minister for the private rented sector, they are in the dark over what is their future. Now, can I ask the Minister two very simple questions? What assessment have Ministers now actually made on the impact this legislation is having on private rented properties not coming to market? Because here in the capital, that is driving the housing crisis and will get worse as autumn approaches and student housing especially changes. And given the very same pressures the Minister says he's listened to and taken on board with regard to the social rented sector, these apply to the private sector and the Minister should understand that. Why this cap and why continuous ministerial powers over the private rented sector will not negatively impact on the number of homes and rents and people renting and able to find an affordable property? Minister. Well, uh, I am sorry, first of all, that Miles uh, Briggs didn't appear to listen to part of the, the statement. I made it clear that in the social rented sector, uh, for uh, the, the COSLA and for the SFHA position, uh, we're looking at a, a, an increase that will uh, be on average £5 a week uh, or 6.1 per cent for those, uh, those two parts of the social rented sector. Uh, I would have hoped, given the concerns that were expressed uh, by members across the, the chamber about the need to balance protection for tenants with the protection uh, for social housing providers to be able to invest in the quality uh, of homes, in maintenance, in supply, as well as in the wider services they provide, I would have hoped uh, that there was a, a strong welcome for the fact that we've reached an agreed way forward with the social rented sector. But that doesn't seem to be the case in relation to, to Mr. Mr Briggs. He describes this as a disaster. What I think would have been a disaster would have been if Parliament had not taken the action that we proposed and that tenants, particularly in the private rented sector, who had been landed with 10, 20, 30, even 40 per cent rent increases were continuing to be exposed uh, to that kind of practice. That is still happening south of the border. It is not happening as a result of the actions that we've taken. Some of the other questions that Mr Briggs raises are about either the measures we'll bring forward later in this month in relation to the future of the cap for the PRS uh, or indeed the longer term work that we're doing to reform uh, the uh, rented sector. Uh, I would uh, I, again express it may be a forlorn hope already but I would express the hope that Mr Briggs uh, will join with other members in recognising that the rented sector does need continued uh, attention, continued legislation to ensure that people's rights that human right to decent, adequate and secure housing uh, is met in future in a way that it is not for everybody so far. I'm Mark Griffin. Thank you, President Officer. I draw members' attention to my register of interest as owner of a private rented property in North Lanarkshire Council um, area. Uh, in November, the Minister reiterated that the freeze legislation is temporary and can only be extended for two further six-month periods. Now, we know that landlords are already preparing increases once the, the freeze ends and the ONS said that by November private rent increases were at the highest level since they started collecting data in 2012. Now the, the long promised rent controls need to seamlessly dovetail I think with the end of this legislation so can the Minister um, commit to ensure that the housing bill passes and that controls um, are introduced in time for the expiration of the provisions um, in this bill uh, and through the moratorium and though the moratorium on eviction continues, um, our monitoring information shows that the Tenant Hardship Grant Fund has only £2.5 million left and 11 councils have spent the entirety of their funds. Can I ask um, what the Government plan to do to renew that fund um, so that tenants who are building up arrears through the moratorium um, eviction don't face a cliff edge when those expire also? Thank Minister. 
Uh, I thank Mark Griffin uh, for his, his questions, which do raise substantial issues that are of concern to us. We do want to ensure that the Tenant Hardship Grant Fund, uh, the Tenant Grant Fund is uh, achieving the greatest possible benefit for, for those who are in need of it, and we are actively engaging uh, with local authorities around the guidance on uh, how that can be uh, 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 delivered uh, as effectively as it possibly can be, and I, and I hope that we can rely on the support of, of Labour to achieve that objective. In relation to the longer term reform, uh, we discussed some of this, of course, during the, the debates on the bill itself. Uh, Labour understand, I know, uh, that the emergency legislation needs to be justified in the context of the ongoing uh, economic circumstances, that cost of living crisis uh, and the requirement within the legislation for us to continue to assess and report on the necessity and proportionality. Uh, and you know, if we, if we weren't doing that, uh, we would have a, a, a much more uh, danger of, uh, of the measures that were being taken being challenged, uh, understandably. We are satisfied for the time being that they remain proportionate uh, and necessary. We will have to keep that under review, and that review is why we can't give an absolute guarantee about what the subsequent decisions would be at later six-month periods. But the legislation does include the mechanism uh, to reform the adjudication uh, methodology so that we can have a bridge into the longer term uh, work that will be taken forward later in this Parliament. Thank you. Paul McLennan to be followed by Jamie Green. Thank you. Can I thank the Minister for his statement and can I welcome the decision on the social rented sector? Uh, I don't agree with the Conservative assessions on rent, especially following discussions with my own local authority. Can I ask the Minister what discussions were held with COSLA since the introduction of the Act and what key issues were raised by them? Minister. Uh, I thank uh, Mr McClellan for the uh, question. Uh, even before uh, we had the, the final debates in Parliament on the legislation, we had already uh, begun an active engagement with uh, COSLA as well as with social uh, housing providers in the, the housing association field uh, through that task and finish group that I mentioned in the statement. Uh, Many of the issues that were raised by those providers were also raised by parliamentarians from across all political parties in Parliament. All of us understand that the social rented sector doesn't exist to make profit. It reinvests rental income for the benefits of tenants in the wider community. Uh, it has affordability built into the way that it operates, and it sets rents in a very different way than the private rented sector. The sector wanted us to understand that. We wanted to be, assure them that we did understand it and take it seriously uh, and that we want to work with them, not just on protecting tenants in the here and now, but investing for the future in adequate supply and, of course, in the transition to net zero, all of which requires them to be able to manage and plan for their investments. I'm really, really pleased that we're able to reach agreement with the sector, uh, and I hope that members across the chamber will be reassure, reassured by that. Jimmy Green to be followed by Evelyn. Uh, thank you. I am genuinely concerned about the potential risk of the lengthening and extension of this in the private sector. I have nothing to declare interest-wise, but I do know that quantitative and robust research data from the private rental market shows that agents are telling us that there has been a marked increase in the number of landlords who are either seeking to sell their properties or who will increase rents between tenancies, and that surely will have a knock-on effect on future rentals. Does the Minister think that this is only going to get worse as a result of the extension? And what consultation did he actually have with the private rented sector in advance of making today's decision? Minister. Uh, we have certainly been in regular dialogue with the private rented sector representatives. Uh, and I have to say, not only uh, landlords and investors, but tenants as well in the private rented sector, whose voices also deserve to be heard. So we've, we've maintained uh, that dialogue. But you know, I, I, I think Jamie Green, you know, Clearly, the Conservatives opposed the principle when we debated the bill of having a, a rent cap in the private rented sector. They're entitled to that view. But I would point out what has been happening to rents in the private rented sector south of the border in the absence of these measures. Rents have been rising at a faster rate uh, than I think has been seen for a long time. Supply is also deeply challenging. And the concentration of property wealth uh, amongst those who own multiple properties uh, as landlords uh, or as businesses that operate as landlords, that has more than doubled in 10, years, so 10 or 20 years. So uh, the, the situation in Scotland does require longer term reform. That is what this government is committed to doing. But I would suggest to Jamie Green that he should recognise that in the absence of these measures, we would be seeing a far more unacceptable position for tenants in Scotland.
Okay, we've got a number of questions, um, members who want to ask questions on this statement. I, I think we're going to have to pick up the pace both on the question but also on the answers, uh, Minister. Evelyn Tweed to be followed by Mercedes Vial. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. As part of the regular monitoring of this vital emergency legislation, has the Scottish Government been working with the Rent Service Scotland and the First Tier Tribunal to examine the volume of ex exceptional rent increase applications by landlords and challenges by tenants? Minister. Uh, yes, of course, we've been uh, actively engaged in that. We we believe that the number of applications for uh, using the prescribed costs uh, available has been relatively low, but we're continuing to work uh, with the, the, the organisations that are part of the landscape and the machinery of delivering that, uh, that, spe that particular form of protection for landlords, given that not all landlords are in the same financial circumstances. We'll continue to keep these issues under close consideration uh, as we move forward with the short-term measures and the longer-term work on reform. Thank you. Mercedes Vialba to be followed by Graham Day. Presiding officer, for as long as tenants have campaigned for a rent freeze, there have been private landlords threatening to sell up in response. So reports of a rise in the number of landlords selling up come as no surprise. But what systems has the minister put in place to monitor these sales and any subsequent evictions to verify these claims? And let's remember that those landlords who have sold up have been able to do so thanks to the eviction exceptions this government included in the legislation. So can the minister tell us how many of those properties sold? Has the affordable housing supply programme supported the purchase of to bring those properties into public ownership and remove any need for evictions? Minister. Uh, well, I, I know that the member well understands the reasons why the exceptions were, were necessary in order to, to demonstrate that the protection against evictions uh, as a whole could be presented as a defensible and a proportionate uh, measure that this Parliament was capable of passing. I, I know that that's, that's well understood. Uh, and I, I, I would point out as well that the, um, the, eviction, the, the eviction exceptions do not include uh, simply the, the desire to make a profit. That is not something that, that landlords can uh, apply for evictions as an exception to the, to the rule at the moment. But yeah, absolutely, we need to ensure that going forward we are working toward a housing system that is fair, that is equitable and meets people's human rights uh, to adequate housing. I, I know that Mercedes Bealba and I share more in common uh, than we have that separates us uh, on the need to achieve that. Uh, and I do hope that we will continue to work together with Labour colleagues uh, as we did during the emergency legislation to try and achieve that. Graham Day to be followed by Willie Rennie. I thank you. Uh, pitch fees, the equivalent of rents for park home occupiers, are not covered by the legislation. I have constituents who are facing demands for a 14 per cent increase in those fees this year, which, given these are all older people, most of them on fixed incomes, it is frankly outrageous. I am aware of the planned consultation on changing the basis for pitch fee increases from RPI to CPI ahead of the forthcoming housing bill, and I very much welcome that. But can I ask the Minister whether there are any additional short term measures the Government might explore? or to afford people in this situation some degree of protection. Minister. Uh, I thank Graeme Day for, for raising this issue, which he, which he has done previously. Uh, and, of course, the, the government's wider support to people uh, in terms of the cost of living response goes far beyond simply the measures that were included in the cost of living tenant protection bill. And I would encourage uh, Mr Day, I'm sure he already is doing, to refer uh, any of his constituents who have concerns about this to the government's uh, wider cost of living uh, website to identify forms of support they may be able to access. But yes, pitch fees are not private residential tenancies. It wouldn't have been possible or appropriate to include them in this bill when it was passed. Uh, but we have accepted the argument that there needs to be uh, a review of that uh, inflation uh, measure, and we will be consulting on that very soon. Willie Rennie to be followed by Ariane Burgess. I think the Minister's right about social housing, but he didn't mention mid-market rents within his statement, so I'd quite like some clarity on that. Kingdom Housing tell me if the rent cap is applied to that tenure, it will reduce the number of MMR properties that they're able to develop. Hillcrest say exactly the same. I've written to the Ministers several times and they've been kind enough to reply several times. But I have to say I'm none the wiser as to what the policy is. So can he clear up what's happening to mid-market rents? Minister. Uh, I thank Willie Rennie for that, that question, and it is a, a substantive uh, issue. Uh, Mid-market rent is uh, are, are rented out as private residential tenancies. Uh, they are not falling within the social rented sector part of the legislation. Uh, they are private residential tenancies, and therefore will be treated in that way. But I think it's really important to mention 
in relation to whether it's a social landlord looking to provide new homes or any other developer looking to provide new homes, the emergency legislation affects in tenancy rent increases. It does not affect the rent setting for new homes. And given that it can only be in operation for a further two six-month periods after the initial period, no developer who is looking to provide new homes should consider this as a barrier uh, to, to setting rents uh, in the first instance for new homes. It's about the setting of rents within tenancies, rent increases within tenancies, which in any case can only take place once a year. So it should have marginal to no impact uh, on any developer looking uh, to decide how much uh, investment they're putting into the provision of new homes. Marianne Burgess to be followed by Emma Rowley. The Minister has highlighted the decisive action to take taken by the Scottish Government to protect tenants through these harshest months of the cost of living crisis. This swift response sits in the context of a firm commitment to introduce long-term rent controls, action which no other part of the UK has come close to matching. Can the Minister say how this response might flow into that longer-term commitment, perhaps by changing the way that tenants can challenge future rent rises? Minister. Uh, I'm, I'm grateful to Ariane Burgess for that, uh, that question. And yes, it is clear that uh, Scotland is the only part of the UK which has taken these necessary measures. And in fact, uh, even when challenged by Plaid Cymru, uh, the Welsh Government decided not to take that bold action uh, and protect tenants in this way. The, the longer term uh, re rent reforms, uh, which, uh, rent and sector reforms, which Ariane Burgess referred to, are extremely important to me. We're already working hard to develop those proposals. Uh, and yes, we do need to ensure that there is a bridge between those proposals, uh, between the emergency legislation and that longer term work. And the changes to the rent adjudication methodology, which the Emergency Act allows us to take forward in future, will achieve that bridge. If we simply return from the rent cap into open market considerations, uh, that could create a, a, an extremely damaging cliff edge. So the uh, adjustments to the rent adjudication uh, methodology will provide that way forward toward the longer term work. Emma Roddick to be followed by Stephen Kerr. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Tenant Protection Act is a crucial and ambitious intervention during one of the hardest winters in recent times. But for the long-term sustainability of the rented sector in Scotland, tenants and landlords will be looking towards the upcoming New Deal for Tenants. So can the Minister assure Parliament that work is continuing towards the implementation of a fairer rented housing system? Minister. Uh, absolutely. Once again, several members have asked this. We are, remain absolutely committed to bringing forward the New Deal for Tenants uh, proposals, which the, the Government has already consulted on. Uh, I want to place once again on record, as I did during the, the debates on the bill, my appreciation for the incredible hard work uh, and energy that's been put into uh, this issue from officials from within the Scottish Government who have be, had a great deal asked of them to deliver this groundbreaking emergency legislation and to continue work on developing uh, that longer term legislation. Uh, and I look forward to uh, being able to introduce that legislation to Parliament and see it scrutinised by members of all parties. Stephen Kerr to be followed by Bob Dorr. <clears throat> the economic consequence of rent control is probably the least disputed of any economic theory. It drives out private landlords and it drives up homelessness. Mm -hmm. I'll give you a case in point, and I'd like the Minister to respond to this. The University of Glasgow, under the threat, under the threat of rent controls, the Uni University of Glasgow students were being told last September, postpone your courses, don't turn up, because of the shrinkage in capacity Briefly, in Kerr. the Glasgow rental housing market. So what is being done now by the Scottish Government, by the Ministers, to ensure that we don't have an even more severe problem this coming September. Minister. Well, I, I certainly disagree uh, with that analysis uh, and the, the, idea, the idea that the serious challenges to student accommodation, which have been experienced for years in Scotland and have been growing south of the border as well, the idea that they relate uh, to um, either emergency or longer term work on uh, rent controls Absolutely. in Scotland is simply spurious. And there are other European countries with a larger, with a larger private rented sector than we have by share of the, the housing stock which have had rent control systems in place for decades. High quality, affordable, sustainable and secure housing is absolutely affordable. It does require further reform. Uh, and the last thing I would say to Mr Kerr is that the one thing that is 
least disputable about this is that if we had not taken action, we would be seeing tenants in Scotland lumbered with the same kind of excessive eye-watering rent increases that they are living with south of the border. And briefly, Bob Dorn. Uh, thank you, President Officer. I was against enforced rent increases and so rent freezes in the social rent sector. Uh, I welcome this will not happen and acknowledge statements of intent from housing associations that rent will not go up by inflation around 11 per cent, but rather by an average of 6.1 per cent. That would be an average £3 a week increase on average and secure £170 million to invest in the sector. However, can I ask how the Scottish Government will monitor how housing associations implement after what is an average increase of 6.1% given, some tenants could potentially face a far more significant increase. And as briefly as possible, Minister. Uh, yes, we will be actively engaging with the whole of the social rented sector, both housing associations and local authorities, uh, to monitor the implementation of this and to understand the impact uh, on tenants. But Mr Doris is right that the agreement we've reached uh, means that the average rent increases will be low and we are all aware of the distinct nature of the, the social housing sector uh, and its uh, hugely important value to communities right across Scotland. Thank you. That concludes this item of business. With apologies to the member, I wasn't able to call. There will be a brief pause before we move on to the next item of business.